Hey, is this thing on? Hello? Hit it again. I think it's on now. <clears throat> Welcome to Hiker Trash Radio, where each week, Doc will drag some colorful characters out of the woods to talk trail and type 2 fun. If you're aspiring hiker trash, or if you're just looking to understand the hiker trash in your life, look no further. So lace up those boots, gnaw on some jerky, and settle into your 20-mile pace as we fire up the podcast from somewhere deep in the backcountry. It's time to embrace the suck. Welcome back to another week on the trail, dirtbags, hiker trash, and of course, good smelling day hikers. I'm Doc, and this is Hiker Trash Radio. Hey, if you like what we're doing, take just a minute and help us out. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you don't like what we're doing, just go ahead and keep that to yourself. All right, let's get to this week's guest, a through hiker and alpine adventure coach with more than 20,000 trail miles under his feet, Adam Salinger. Welcome to Hiker Trash Radio, Adam. How's it going? It's going great. It's good to be here. Now, did I get that right? I, I almost think that's a misprint. 20,000 miles? A lot of miles. It's been 45 plus years, so a lot of miles in all those years. Yeah, yeah. Right. Same pair of shoes? Ah, same pair of shoes. Not a chance from boots to to trail runners, to high top trail runners and everything in between. Yeah. A lot of experience. I love it. I love it. Now, Adam, with all those miles under your feet, I am almost positive that you've had to have picked up a trail name along the way. Yes. I, I have been dreamer since 2000 on the Appalachian Trail. Yes. Dreamer. And tell us about that. How'd you come by that name? It's a multifaceted name. In the year 2000, I was one of the only, if not the only, Californian on the Appalachian Trail. So that was a biggie. But it was it was multi-layered in that I was playing around my with my dreams at that point. And hiking the Appalachian Trail had been a dream since I was about eight, nine years old. So it was there were a lot of different levels to that name, and it just fit. Nice. I, I really like it. I, I, I think it suits you. I've only talked to you for about let's see three minutes here but i think i see that quality in you so that 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 is well suited now i have to say i told you before we began that you win the background competition because if, if you're just listening to this apple podcast or spotify or stitcher or whatever wherever you consume your podcast you're missing out because dreamer has an incredible, it's not a virtual background. It's actually what's on his wall, I believe. And he's got a couple of big maps there that go north to south. And he's got a six pack of pictures that are just incredible right behind him. Yeah, they're from a lot of different places. I've been the the maps of the Appalachian Trail in uh, 2000 and then my most recent uh, hike of the Colorado Trail on the right hand side. And then the pictures are from everywhere in the eastern Sierras, which are my backyard and my number one love to couple of the Colorado Trail and then a couple more of the uh, Gates of the Arctic up in uh, up in Alaska. So some of my favorite places. Now, can you take us through each one of those pictures, especially the top two, the ones I can see the best over your head there? What are those top two pictures? Uh, the top one on the left is uh, Mitre Basin, which is one of my absolute favorite places on the planet out of uh, Cottonwood Lakes area over Old Army Pass and then all off trail use trails to, uh, to the back of Mount Whitney. Um, looks like something from another country for sure. And then the one on the right is the one of the biggest drops on the Colorado Trail um, into the Elk Creek drainage, the Molas Pass area, after you get off the uh, what's called the uh, High 23, where you're above 12,500 feet for about 25, 23 miles. Two, two great places that I've hiked, that I've camped, and that I, I love taking myself back to with pictures. Nice. Now you said that was Mitre Basin out of Cottonwood Pass? Yeah, Mitre Basin. Yeah. 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 So All we, off trail. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We did the High Sierra Trail in 2022, but we took an alternate at the end. We did not exit out of Whitney because we'd already been through there quite a few times. And so we decided to go out through Cottonwood Pass and get picked up there, but we elected not to take the New Army Pass. And so I have a feeling mm. I missed a big, beautiful segment there. I'm, I'm going to have to go back and do that again. 
it's an amazing segment. The, the entire segment from Old or New Army Pass in, into Miter Basin, over Crabtree Lakes Pass, and then down the Crabtree Lakes Basin with Upper, Middle, and Lower Crabtree Lakes is just absolutely stunning. Yeah. yeah. Now, there's three of us that do these summer trips, and uh, my choice was High Sierra Trail two summers ago. Last summer, this one that just passed, we're just getting over, Chopper had picked out a nice spot in Desolation Wilderness for us to check out. And so, Buddy, it's Buddy's choice next year. I'm going to have to find a way to subtly influence him to go back to uh, the New Army Pass, Miter Basin area. It's a gem. It's a gem. I'd highly recommend it. There's a million lakes and they're all swimmable and fishable. It's a great place. Nice. Okay. Hey, have you listened to the podcast before, Dreamer? I have. Lots. Lots, huh? Yeah. So we, we've just undergone a rebranding this season with Hacker Trash Radio from the John Freaking Muir Pod. What do you think? I like it. I like it. I, I miss the John Muir ode. I'm a John Muir lover and a John Muir trail lover. Haven't done that trail three times. And, but I think it's the new, the, the new purpose for all titles and segments ring more true towards hikers. So I think it's, it's apropos. Nice. Nice. Now yeah. I, have, I have a question for you. I don't think I've asked this question on the podcast before. So I saved it for you, Dreamer. You ready? All right. All right. First time question, hiker trash or not? Boy, I've never slept in a bathroom, so I'm not <laughs> sure that I'm going to qualify. But I think there's, I think there's other qualifiers. I was thinking in my own past, I've worn the hat, and I've gotten asked because longtime listeners have have heard the interview with Ivy Tat and his definition of what hiker trash is: mm-hmm. like sleeping in an outhouse somewhere or, or in a, a pit toilet. And uh, I haven't done that. I haven't done that. So do I? Did I earn the cred to to wear the hat? And I'm thinking. If, if you sandwich five or six guys into the cab of a pickup trip on a on a ride and, and you guys have been out for a while, you all smell pretty ripe. That could be a hiker trash moment, right? I think so. I think hiker trash moment, it's in, involve eating food off floors and definitely not showering, never doing your laundry, those kinds of things. So yeah, probably hiker trash at that point. Okay. So did you say, yes, you are hiker trash or you're disagreeing that I'm hiker trash? I'm agreeing with both hiker trash at that point, I believe. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what is your hiker trash moment that you wear as a badge? Boy, I just think I do big miles in in warm environments a lot, and I sweat till my clothes are soaking wet, and that that tends to tends to be messy at times in lots of ways. So, I think the dirtiness in terms of long distance hiking is is what uh, puts me in that category. I think wearing the same pair, same outfit and not washing it for days, weeks, that eventually it's got to start walking by itself. It knows the routine. It's got to be helpful, right? (laughs) Yeah, it's learned by then. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) All right. Trailblazers Toolkit. Speaking of segments, here's our first one. It is the Trailblazers Toolkit sponsored by the Ultralight Backpacking Gear Company, Six Moon Designs. I love to talk about gear, Dreamer. And I love to hear about the most important item in my guest adventure pack. So if you were preparing for your next adventure and I was the one supplying you with all your gear, what is the one item that you would insist on being packed? Make sure to give me all the specifics on that piece of gear and tell me why you've got to have it out there. And this could be any kind of item. It could be gear. It could be apparel. It could be a luxury item. So Dreamer, what is that item in your toolkit? My, my hike and style is starting before sunrise and ending after sunset. And I'm really, I'm beat by the end. I'm done. And I don't want to do a lot of thinking or a lot of work when I set up camp. So blowing up an air mattress is not the thing that I want to do. So I have carry an air compressor out there. I do not carry an air compressor, <laughs> but that'd be a good one. If we could figure out an ultralight version, that would be wonderful. No, what I carry is I've made a bunch of DIY pack liner slash blow bags. So I take a garbage bag and I either cannibalize one of the old blow bags that comes with the, the uh, blow up mattress that I don't want to carry because it's useless in other ways, or I'm carrying a Nemo tensor right now and a piece of half inch PVC fits that perfectly. So I just duct tape a piece of uh, half inch PVC to the corner of a garbage bag. And I use that as the pack liner. And I also have an enormous bag then that I only have to fill really three times to uh, fill a fill an air mattress. So that's the one in terms of being lazy out there. I don't like to blow up an air mattress. 
Genius, genius. Yeah, not much left in the lungs at the end of a sunrise to sunset hike. Not at all. Yeah. And you know that they are including those types of items in some of the some of the, the kits now. Yeah. They come yeah. with the the pad. They're useless though. They're not waterproof, number one. The one that comes with the Nemo has a tiny little um, opening um, that's meant for air and nothing else. So you can't use the bag for anything else. So it's dead weight. I, I don't like carrying a lot of dead weight and I like carrying things that have multiple uses. So that therefore I've, I've created all those bags and I have multiple pads. So I've got one that fits a, a Thermarest. I've got one that fits a Nemo and I just switch them out. I can tell I'm talking to somebody with 20,000 miles under <laughs> multiple uses, no single use items out there. Everything's got to have multiple purposes. Nice. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. All right. And hey, to keep us talking about the gear. It's the hiking pole. Now, as a longtime listener, you're familiar with the hiking pole. I am. I you know am. what I'm going to say right now. I'm pretty sure I know what you're going to say, unless you're going to mix it up. Yeah. No, I'm not yep. going to mix it up. I, I, <laughs> I'm right. a creature of habit. Uh, as, right. So that's pole spelled with two L's, not, uh, not like the things you carry in your hands out there. This is, this is like a survey. And your reaction is exactly like everybody else's. They're very well played, sir. You knew that line was coming too. <laughs> Perfect. So this is a seven question survey. It's going to help me give you a score on the sanity scale from one to hundred with one being completely insane, 100 being completely sane. And I think that there is an automatic 30 point deduction for anybody with over 20,000 miles. <laughs> <trail runners. laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> your, your top possible score tonight, sir, is 70. All right. Now, how would your friends and family describe you on the sanity scale? Definitely south of 50 somewhere for south sure. Of 50, yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> all right. Now, have you heard all three sets of questions? I don't think I've heard three. I've probably heard two sets of questions. Okay, yeah. good, good. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I'm saving up the third set for you. I'm going to come all on right. your toes, sir. All right. <laughs> all right. So uh, this is not rapid fire. This requires you to give me a, a, an answer and then explain your answer because that'll help with the calculation of your final score. Alrighty. Okay. Question number one, when you're out there on the trail and you've got somebody with you, what are the top three topics of conversation for you? What are you talking about there? I think the number one topic is probably that person's life story. Tell me about yourself. I think that's where it all starts in terms of if I'm spending any lengthy time with somebody and then it, it, it quickly moves into gear from there and then it usually moves into food because I'm fascinated by how people choose to eat out there and what works for them and always getting ideas and making changes for my own kit and diet. So yeah, those three. Okay. And a follow-up question. What is your go-to item of food to talk about? I'm really fascinated right now to talk to people about cold soaking because I'm moving back in that direction after testing it out about 10 years ago for a while. I'm fascinated to hear about people's recipes and what they're doing that's not just eating ramen and creating things like sushi bowls and all kinds of other things that sound actually like they might taste maybe good. <laughs> Dreamer, you are so fortunate that we're not going with number one <laughs> of questions. <laughs> yeah, I realized that when I brought up the cold soaking piece. <laughs> <laughs> I ordinarily don't deduct any points for the follow-up questions, but this this might require a deduction. <laughs> All right, understood. <laughs> okay. I've talked to a number of people with this third set of questions, and it's funny. The first two answers vary quite a bit, depending on the person, but food always seems to make an appearance on what they're talking about out there. Yeah, it's an interesting topic and everybody comes at it from a different place. So it's really fascinating to hear how people think about it, what they choose to do out there. Yeah, I, I think in terms of me, by the afternoon of day two, I'm talking about the next cheeseburger I'm going to have. Right? <laughs> when <I get> into <laughs> town <somewhere. laughs> yeah, the next town food does come into uh, play very often, for sure. Now, Dreamer, question number two, uh, I'm, I'm interested to hear your answer on this one because you've been out there quite a bit. And you've talked to a lot of people. So what is the best trail name you've encountered out there? Oh. Hmm. I met a guy named Privy once. And, and, and he lived up to his name because he spent a lot of time in Privy. I think that was probably one of the most creative names that I've come across. Yeah, probably Privy. 
Privy. Privy. Yeah. 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 Another popular topic for question number one is bathroom habits or bodily functions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, does, that doesn't surprise me. Privy. Uh, yeah. That's probably top of his list then for his discussion page. <laughs> and if you've been listening, you, you may have heard the story about the guy who met somebody on trail whose trail name was Poop Hands. And he introduced himself as Poop Hands as he was shaking this guy's hand, which is, you know, a whole bit of uncomfortable situation. <laughs> Very uncomfortable. Do yes. you immediately yes. go and wash your hands after that? Or what is the proper <laughs> etiquette? Yes, that, there's no etiquette. You do wash your hands immediately. <laughs> Safety first. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Question number three. Speaking of bodily functions, toilet paper, <laughs> bidet, leaves, or something else? I've been toilet paper for years and years, but I've moved to a bidet. Really? So, uh, yeah. I just use a bidet on the entire Colorado Trail, and it was refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> do you warm up the water at all or you just go with ice cold it it never got super cold so the water wasn't ice cold right it was water that had been sitting in a bottle overnight there you go yeah okay now it, it's probably very important not to mix up your water bottle with your bidet bottle very important very important different color caps are uh imperative yes. see that some someone is thinking out there this yep. that's, that's brilliant Okay. Yep. Yep. Now I have to ask, did you practice at home for a while? I did. I did practice at home for a while. That was a while back. Yeah. The first time I've moved in and out of different, different structures out there in the back country from how I eat to yeah, what I use for the bathroom. But uh, yeah, originally there was some practice at home for now, sure. As, as through hikers are getting ready for hikes, as they're getting new gear, as they're trying out new stuff, they're trying out, you know, different tarp pitches. I mean, we go through a lot of practice before we get out there. And it stands to reason that if, you, if you're planning to go to the bidet method, that you would do some practice. Absolutely. There needs to be practice in terms of all of those processes at home, for sure. For sure. On Yeah. Now, with a trail bidet, you're, you're basically squirting a bottle at yourself, right? There's a, yeah, there's a piece that goes on the bottle that makes that squirting easier. Yes. Yes. And more targeted, should I say. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Tar targeted is good. I have, targeted. To ask the, I have to ask the question though. Ask away. I, I'm, not, I'm asking for a friend. It's not for me. Of but course. Asking for a friend. <laughs> Can you really get yourself fully clean just by giving yourself a squirt? You can. There's an entire continent that's proved that in terms of using the dates for hundreds of years, right? So it must work. So yeah, it, it does work. And, it, and in, in, I think if you talk to people who use a bidet in the backcountry and that's what they choose to do, they'll tell you that they get cleaner. And I think that's true. I do think that's true. Okay. And it's not just squirt and nothing else. Is there another part of the process that I'm, I'm just not aware of? There is another part of the process. Okay. Yes. You are, you are cleaning yourself. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Got it. Yeah. And is that typically with wipes or... It, it can towel? be typical. It can the drying method is is definitely a towel. A Kula cloth is a great way to go in terms of an antibacterial towel to to dry yourself. The cleaning part can be a variety of different ways. I, I've heard of people using wipes. I've heard of people using nothing. I've heard of people using a latex glove that they then turn out inside out and throw in their Ziploc or in their Mylar bag zip bag whatever it might be. So I know there's a lot of different philosophies and processes that people use. See that I am learning at the foot of the master right here. Thank you. Yep, absolutely. I'm here for you. Okay. Question number four, in light of your sunrise to sunset hiking style, do you do breakfast in camp on trail or no breakfast? I walk out of camp usually with a, like a cliff shot into my mouth to give me a little bit of caffeine. And then I stop when I find something beautiful and I make breakfast. Yeah. And it usually coincides with sunrise or just before sunrise and that nautical twilight, that blue sky that's, that's turning into twilight. But yeah, that's when I'm usually making my coffee and a little bit of oatmeal when I've got a stove with me for sure. Yeah. Okay. Now question number five, do you prefer solo hiking or hiking with others like a tramway? I prefer solo hiking, but I, within my solo hikes, I love connecting with people for, it's usually based on my hiking style. It's usually no more than a block of hours. 
it's usually not more than a day because I'm usually going further than most people are, are going to go in a day, which means, unfortunately, I don't usually see any of the same people on a lot of the trails that I hike that I saw the day before. But for instance, on the Colorado trail that I just hiked, I hiked with, with one person for two or three hours one day, one person for four or five hours one day, and then one person over two different days, because I took a half a day in town, about four hours one day, about five hours the other day. And those are just, those are great times to, to, to dig in and, and have some conversations with somebody other than yourself. Now, what is your pace? How many, how many miles do you cover on average? Anywhere from about 25 to 35 miles a day. The, the Colorado Trail was an average of 26 miles a day over 19 days. And my biggest day was 38 miles. So I, I like doing the big miles. Um, I hike for long periods of time during the day, but I'm not a super fast hiker. It's just if you're walking for 14 hours a day, 16 hours a day, you're going to get pretty far. Um, I swim in, in, in lots of lakes and I talk to lots of people and I take lots of dirt naps. So between all those things, I get pretty far on a, on a daily basis. Yeah. If, if you meet somebody on the trail, you probably only meet them once because I, not everybody's doing 35 miles a day or, or, 20 yeah. a day or 20 miles a day. Yep. Yep. I meet them once. I meet them once. I hiked with a gal on the Colorado trail that, that I hiked with one day and three days later, um, I caught up with her again because I had taken half a day off trail and that was great. But in the 19 days I hiked, she was the only person that I saw multiple times, except for some, some bike backers actually. Okay. Yeah. Your, your trail name could be ghost. Cause where'd he go? Ghost. Yeah. Ghost. Yep. All right. Question number six, I think it's six. Yes. Six. Rank the following in your order of preference. So one mile severe uphill, one mile severe downhill, or a 20 mile road walk. This is easy. I just said to somebody the other day, I said, if you could give me an American long distance trail that was all uphill, I would take it in a heartbeat. <laughs> I cannot stand going downhill. And the older I get, the harder it is on my body. Uh, and, and same for road walks. Um, I, I, I feel the best. I feel the strongest going uphill. So I will always choose uphill over pretty much any other kind of terrain for sure. Okay. For sure. Of, those, of those three, what's number two? Two would probably be the road walk. The downhills are just a killer. <laughs> just a killer. Yeah. I know we have some folks listening to us right now going, what in the world is he talking about? It's downhill. Gravity's yeah. doing the work. It's easy. Yeah. Why, why doesn't he like downhill? But severe downhill it can beat you up pretty bad. Oh, it rocks you to the core. Yeah. No matter how much weight you have on your back, even if you got a super light backpack, just the jarring that your bones and your joints take with every step on a downhill is, uh, you feel that for a long time, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Now, before we get to question number seven, I, I will get a bunch of hate mail. If I don't ask you, somebody with 20,000 miles uh, under your belt, what is your, your base weight? What was your base you know, weight on Colorado Trail? Base weight on Colorado is uh, about 10 and a half pounds, about 10 and a half pounds. It really fluctuates from trip to trip, trail to trail. If I'm with people, if I'm not with people, if I'm carrying a tent, if I'm carrying a tarp, if I'm carrying a quilt, if I'm carrying a sleeping bag, if I'm going with friends that are going to be hanging out a lot and I carry a chair, if I'm carrying a stove or I'm cold soaking, it's all very situational based. Every one of my trips is different, some by a lot, some by just little tweaks. But, but for the Colorado trail, it's 20, 10 and a half pounds. I carried no more than about six days of food at a time. My, my pack wasn't much over about 18 pounds, 17, 18 pounds. Never had to carry a lot of water on that trail this year either. Yeah, pretty light pack. Yeah, what's the lightest you've been? I think I've been down to the, just right around nine, low nine. But I think once I, I was actually messing with my spreadsheet the other day, um, looking at what it was going to look like if I moved my sleeping bag out, my quilt in, and took the cook set out and everything I used to cook. And it was just under nine to do those things. So that might be next summer's next summer's trip in terms of how my kit looks. Spreadsheet. I love it. You got the spreadsheet with all your gear, all its weight. You just move the pieces around and you know what it's going to be. Yep. Yep. It's easy to tell. Absolutely. It's it, And it's a fun exercise to take things in and put thing, take things out, put things in and think about buying something and how that would fit into the entire mix and all that good stuff. Yeah. I have said to a lot of people that planning for a trip and doing the logistics and planning, but also uh, things like that with gear and trying to mix and match and figure out what's the right 
bit of gear to bring and how much it's going to cost, how much is away. That That is almost as fun as the trip itself. It is. The planning, the planning time that I put into big trips is enormous. And in terms of campsites and miles and that kind of stuff, all that goes out the window when I get out there. But I know that I've planned it and I've learned about everything and that that helps me make good decisions when I'm out there. But yeah, diving into all those things. I'm a huge, I'm I'm very interested in calories per ounce in terms of food. So I'm constantly trying to lighten my food while at the same time bring things that I want to eat. So that's always interesting too, which is why it's one of those top things that I like to talk about with other people on the trail. Got it. Okay. Question number seven. I want you to take take us through from uh, head to toe. What are you wearing? Let's put the pack aside. What, What are you wearing out there on your hikes? I'm wearing a ball cap. Um, with, with a patch on it from somewhere I've hiked. Right now, it's got a Katahdin patch on it. I'm wearing a hoodie. I've been wearing a hoodie since before they were making hoodies in, in synthetic materials. I was wearing a cotton hoodie, and everybody was laughing at me in the late 90s, early 2000s. So I'm wearing a Farpoint hoodie right now, which are really a company out of Oregon, a little cottage company on the coast. You tell me you made your own hoodie. No, I didn't do that. That would have <laughs> been a good one, though. That would have been awesome. That would have been awesome. I'm wearing some old on a pants, like a really thin version that they don't make anymore. I'm a pants guy now instead of a shorts guy, try and keep as much covered as possible in terms of not having to wear sunscreen. So I'm also wearing sun gloves on my hands. So with the sun gloves, the sun hoodie and the prana pants, all you need to do is hit your hit the, the back of your neck and your ears, right? I don't even need the back of my neck. Yeah. The, with the hoodie on. Right. Exactly. Oh, that's true. That's true. Just, just right here. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very little sunscreen. And then on my feet, I've got Lone Peak hikers right now. High top version of the Lone Peak. Had lots of ankle issues, gone through lots of PT for my ankle issues. I know there's a lot of science behind boots and high tops not making a big difference, but I think that science is skewed because I don't think that science takes into account people with pre-existing conditions like I have. And I've got a lot of ligament damage to both my ankles from all the turns over all the years. So I, I have a little bit extra support with those hikers on my feet. A dreamer, that was a preemptive strike right there. You, you, you said it was on your feet. You said, okay, doc, Doc's going to tell me there's research yep. out there. Yep. Before I can even open my mouth, you're already edging no. your foot there. I'm ready for you. I'm ready nice. for you. Man, it's going to be a tough one. It's going to be a tough <laughs> one. All right. Hey, sit back for a little bit. I got to do some math. I got to take off the shoes. Use all 20 digits here. We're going to, you got to carry the three. So I got to multiply by pi and we're going to divide that by root five. And I'm going to adjust for the angle of your bidet, your pocket <laughs> bidet. And I come up with a score of 38. You are so Wow. Crazy, 38. 38. <laughs> All right. I'm up there with some of the crazies. Is that higher or lower than you expected? (laughs) That's a little lower than I expected. Maybe a little bit, (laughs) but probably not lower than some of my friends and family would expect. So there you go. Uh, You probably would have been above 50, but you mentioned cold soak. I had to deduct. (laughs) All right. Hey, before we get too far on the trail, Dreamer, take us back. Tell us where you grew up, where you were raised, what kinds of sports and hobbies did you play? as a kid and how'd you get involved in the through hiking cult specifically i want to know how you first heard about these things these trails that go for thousands of miles and what was your reaction do you remember that moment i do i do i'll start at the beginning of that um, question i grew up in la concrete jungle where, i had where, a fan- where in la right near la brea tar pits okay. um, about a block away from la brea tar pits uh, i went to elementary school there my family was not an outdoorsy family the, out, the most outdoorsy thing we would do would be to go to an L.A. city park and sit in chairs and play on the swings. So that was the big outdoorsy thing. I played soccer all the way from kindergarten all the way into high school. That was my sport. Then I moved, I moved in at the end of elementary school, I moved to San Luis Obispo. So halfway in between L.A. and San Francisco on the coast. Uh, I went to middle school there. I went to high school there and played soccer that whole time. When I was eight years old, my grandmother who was sending my first cousin to summer camp in on the East Coast, decided I got to send my other grandkid to summer camp as well. So my, my parents were from the East Coast and summer camp to them meant going away for the entire summer. Because in the East Coast, when you go to camp, you go away for the majority of the summer. West Coast- so Nice for the parents. Yeah, super nice. Yeah, <laughs> it gets better. It gets better. It gets better. 
It does. So West Coast, there's no camps like that. So they found a camp that's still in existence up out of Quincy, Portola area, California, called Walton's Grizzly Lodge. And Walton's had five sessions over the summer, and they were two and three week sessions. <clears throat> and all the campers went to a session and then they came home. I didn't go to one session. I went to all five sessions. So my parents sent me for the entire summer. So I went to all five sessions. I was the only kid at camp during the break between sessions every time. But the cool thing about the camp was it exposed me to a million things I never would have been exposed to. It, it, I learned to water ski and I learned to ride a BMX bike and I learned to shoot guns and I learned to shoot bow and arrow. And I, I learned to do all these different things. But the biggest thing I learned was every single session had a backpacking trip. While most kids got to go once a summer, I got to go five times a summer. And that was, that was the 80s and 70s and 80s and beginning of my backpacking experience. When I was eight, maybe nine years old, right around 75, 76, 77, somewhere in there, I was in the lodge of the camp where we ate and played games and everything. And there were magazines and books throughout the lodge. And... Um, I've got both these copies ready to show oh. you because I have these copies. So there were two things that I pulled out of these shelves that just blew me away. And one was a book published in like 74, 75 called The Appalachian Trail, super old book. And the other was a National Geographic that was posted in 70, 71 for the Pacific Crest Trail. So these two things were in those shelves. And I Happened to pull them both out. I don't know if they were near each other or what, but I was mesmerized and immediately thinking, I want to hike something big someday. I don't know what I want to hike, but I want to hike something. So it was eight or nine years old and it was at camp and it was those two, those two magazine slash books that I had to go out and find years later. So I had copies of my own. So how many volumes on all the shelves? How many books or magazines were on these? Oh, there there are probably 150 books and magazines in that room. And somehow I ended up finding those too. You yeah. pulled those too. That's a sign right there, Dreamer. It was a sign. It was a, yeah, it was a sign. It was, was a sign message. for sure. You, yeah. Message delivered. It was, it was. And they, that camp and the counselors there, they, they taught me how to backpack and backpacking looked a lot different than it does today when I was a kid. And it looked a lot different in 2000 when I hiked the AT than it does now. But the basics and the processes and the structures, they didn't differ. They were all the same. So that's where it all started. Okay. Now, let me ask you, by the time the fifth session came around, were you, <laughs> you an honorary camp counselor? Are you teaching the newcomers how to do stuff? I was helping out. Yeah. Especially the older I got, especially the older guy. And then I, I eventually was a, a junior counselor and then eventually I was a counselor. And yeah, I stayed at that camp from the time I was eight to the time I was 20 years old. So I spent a lot of time up in the mountains of the Sierras as a kid and young adults for sure. Okay. Now, now what did you mean when you said that the structures have not changed? A lot of things have, have changed about hiking over the decades, but you said the structures have not. Just the processes. I'm big about process, having a process for just about everything out there, having a process for what your day is going to look like, having a process for knowing where water is, having a process that uh, makes sure that you're getting enough calories during the day, having a process in terms of anytime you, you take a break that when you get up and you start walking again, you check that area to make sure you haven't left, it, left anything sitting there. Just all of those processes that that kind of wind their way through the generations of what backpacking looks like and wind their way through whatever kind of trail you're hiking. They stay consistent. So they taught me a lot of foundational things that, that I'm thankful for and still use today. Okay. Well said. Now, what are you doing these days to pay the bills? How do you finance your adventures? I've been an educator for just about 30 years. I started out in the general ed classroom. I taught fourth and fifth grade, and I did a loop for lots of years where I stayed with kids for two years at a time. And while I was doing that, I, fourth grade was always about the John Muir Trail, and fifth grade was always about the Appalachian Trail in terms of uh, California social studies and history. And what we learn here in this state, we learn about the state in fourth grade and, and the United States and, and back east and the history in fifth grade. Did that for 20 years. And then I opened a school for a neighboring school district. And it was a K-12 independent study school centered around outdoor education. So my young kids, I took out for day trips. Uh, my middle school kids, I took out for 
overnight or one of one or two nights. And then my high school kids, I would take out into the back country for four or five, six nights at a time into Yosemite, into Zion, into Bryce, into lots of different places. And they would earn their, they would earn their credits by working with their core teachers to develop units of study that they would do prior, during the trip, and then after the trips. And that was a lot of fun as well. That was terrific. And then transitioned from that, and now I'm on the bridge to retirement, I'm hoping, and I am serving as a homeschool teacher. So I am working with parents who have chosen to homeschool their children and working with those parents to learn how to be the most the, the most effective, best parent educators that they can be for their kids. So that's that's a day job. And then I've opened a side business as well called Alpine Adventure Coaching, which is something I've wanted to do for years and years. And it's really putting my 30 years of education experience together with my 45 plus years of backpacking experience and working with people who are interested in either learning the ins and outs of uh, long distance hiking or interested in taking their backpack into the next level and moving from two, three night excursions into excursions that involve resupplies and town stops and all the things that big hikes include. So that's the new direction that I'm going on the side right now. You're out there creating new dreamers. I'm hoping to, I'm hoping to, it's the people that we all as backpackers see out there on the trail who maybe aren't so sure about what they're doing and maybe have, have quote, learned everything they've learned off of some Instagram accounts and possibly some YouTube stuff, but they maybe get out there and find that what's going on out there looks a lot different than what uh, social media made it look like. And maybe that they're not as prepared as they wanted to be. And those are the people that, that I'm really looking at targeting in on to help them gain the fundamental skills and the foundational skills that I got to gain. And I was so lucky to gain prior to getting into this, this through hooking cult world. Nice. Now you and I are of a similar age, I believe, we're both in education. So what, what year did you graduate high school? 86. Okay. You're a year behind me. I was 85. Okay. I was 85. All right. So yeah, I feel the whisperings of retirement calling me as well. Got a few more years left here. And when we get back from the break, we're gonna take a quick break. But when we get back from the break, I have some follow-up questions about your Alpine. I'm sorry, how did you describe it? Alpine adventure. Alpine adventure coaching. Alpine adventure coaching. Asking for a friend in, in three or four years when somebody retires and they're looking to take on one of the long trails. What I want you to think about this over the break. What kind of advice, what kind of coaching would you give that person? So don't say anything right now. We're gonna take a quick break. Gonna hear from the advertisers, pay a few bills, and we'll be right back. And welcome back. We were talking to Adam Salinger, aka Dreamer, and we've had a lot of fun going through that first segment and covering a lot of ground. But when we left at the break, we were referring to someone, I don't know who, who, who may retire in a few years, who may want to do a long trail. And so what kind of advice, what kind of coaching would you do or what resources would you point this person to if they're thinking about doing something like the AT or the PCT? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So the way Alpine Adventure Coaching is structured at this point is I've developed 12 hours of interactive online curriculum. And that curriculum goes through four modules on four, four, three hour days, basically. But the goal of Alpine Adventure Coaching is our mission is empowering future long distance backpackers with the critical skills, knowledge, and confidence that they need to plan and prepare and safely complete a journey filled with diverse outdoor challenges. And the curriculum speaks to that from beginning to end. The curriculum starts out with the planning of a hike and the investigating of where you want to go and why you want to go there and flows all the way through to the last module, which is that reintegration into society, into the front country, which I think is something that most through hikers don't plan for. And I think it's something that's really important to have in your mind and not just wing 
because I've seen and experienced myself way too many through hikers that finish a trail and are completely lost and go into that funk of depression. So the curriculum hits on all of those pieces. I think in terms of your friend, I think your friend needs to figure out which, which trail that he or she wants to hike, figuring out what season he or she wants to hike that trail. And that starts to give you some good ideas about then going and finding some other people who have done that same trail in that same season and starting to look at all kinds of facets of their hikes. And I think that's really important is to gather as much information as you can from as many credible sources as you can in terms of planning a through hike. Uh, I think that planning a through hike in the year 2023 is much different than decades in, in the past. There's a plethora of int information. All the big trails have, have conservatories or coalitions that have tons and tons of information, which is almost all that was available 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago. But it's a great place to start still in, in terms of the, the trail that I just hiked, the Colorado Trail. I think that they're the Colorado Trail Foundation is one of the strongest trail foundations in the country at this point. And I'm a member of many trail foundations in the country. But starting with one of those organizations is, is a great place to start in terms of starting to understand that specific trail. And then once you've zeroed in on the trail that you want to hike, and then all the deep digs and the deep planning start in terms of pacing and logistics and resupply and gear and all of those things. And the curriculum that, that I put together walks through each one of those things sequentially in terms of really getting a hiker to ask those questions of themselves, looking at packing for your fears, looking at base weights, looking at all the things that through hikers, um, uh, seasoned through hikers still struggle with and still go back and forth with and, and still have to make hard decisions before every one of their through hikes with. So I think really getting a, a balcony view of, of what a through hike is and then being able to jump off that balcony and get into the seats and start figuring out all the details and all the minutia in terms of what a hike's going to look like. And everyone's going to plan differently. Some people to plan down to where they're going to stay every single night for a through hike. And some people have, have no clue where they're going to stay on a nightly basis. I'm personally in the middle. I like to have a skeleton plan of where I think I'm going to stay at night. Um, and some nights I end up staying in those places and some nights I, I don't, but I like the planning process. Um, and I think the planning process is important whether you stick to specific plans or you don't, because once you're out there, you've got all that knowledge um, and you can use that knowledge in the back country that you have gained in the front country to make your trip more enjoyable, more successful and safe. And I think those are the key tenets of planning a through hike. Now, Dreamer, I have to tell you that this whole Alpine Adventure coaching curriculum seems like it was put together by an educator because I get this whole sense of intro, into, through, and beyond. I've never heard of a hiking curriculum that has really taken into account post-trail depression. You're looking at the whole package. I really am. Doing it. And then when you're off the trail, what is the impact going to be? And so that that is pretty damn impressive. It's been fun. And it's, it's a matter of putting my passions together and, and seeing what I can put together and what I can offer. And in terms of what do I feel most competent in terms of teaching outside of what would be taught in a classroom situation, it's backpacking. I'm a, I'm a constant student of change in terms of philosophy, in terms of gear, in terms of every choice you can make on the trails. I might be an older guy in terms of understanding where backpacking was in the 80s and 90s and the early 2000s, but I got my finger on where it is in 2023, most definitely in terms of the gear that's hot, the best practices in terms of wilderness first aid and safety in the backcountry, meal planning, all those things. It's been fun to put together and I'm, I'm excited to start sitting down with people who are, who are excited to learn and who are excited for their through hikes. And that's a win for me because it makes me excited about my future through hikes as well. Now, constant listener, if you've been, if you've been tuned in for the last, what, 52 minutes or so, 
you like me would start to be concerned a little bit about the final exam for this course. This is, he's not sitting you down for three hours a day and just covering a few things. I have a feeling this is like an in-depth look at what you need to be concerned about when you're out there. Yeah, I think the final exam is going to look like a conversation with me after you get back from your hike. I think that's what the final exam is going to be okay. in terms of what worked, what didn't work. What do you wish I would have gone deeper into in terms of the curriculum? What was the most helpful? Kind of all of those things. So as much, uh, as much feedback for me in terms of being better at what I do in terms of my craft, as well as entertaining for me to hear about their hike. Yeah. Now you mentioned out there the planning and how detailed some planners are. And I think that there probably is a, a component to your curriculum that talks about problem solving because you cannot account for every contingency. You're going to have to do some problem solving out there. It's like when my, my, my mom, I'm trying to talk my mom through some technology issue, right? And she gets a, she gets a, a yellow tablet out, a yellow piece of paper, legal size, and starts writing down the steps. Okay, number one, I do this. Number two, I do this. And I'm trying to explain it to her conceptually. Just understand the concept. If you understand the concept and what, what we're trying to do here, you can apply it to many different situations. But if you're just trying to find a formula for that one specific piece of potential potentiality, then you're very limited in, in what you can respond to. And so you have yeah. to problem solver out there. Absolutely. Which are the last few words of my mission statement filled with diverse outdoor challenges. And that's the key is understanding, okay, if, if you're using a tent and your tent pole breaks, what are we going to do? What do you have in your kit where you can, um, where you can fix it for a temporary fix until you can get to a town where you can fix it as a permanent fix if you've got what you need. Um, and that goes for wilderness first aid too. I'm, I've got my woofer, my wilderness first responder certification. Um, and in terms of, of being a woofer, one of the, one of the big things in training, um, in terms of that certification is being able to be creative in the back country in terms of using what you have to solve your problems. So using what you have to build a splint, not necessarily carrying a splint all of those kinds of diverse outdoor challenges. So yeah, those are definitely things that, that we talk about within the class and definitely things that we have in-depth conversations about as well. Now, Dreamer, I'm always on the lookout for a trail name for the episode. And I think I've discovered it. I think I've found it. Because you're an educator, I'm an educator. And what we're talking about here, this is AP through hiking. It is AP right? through hiking, it, it, yeah. It, 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 Placement through hiking. It is worth those extra college credits. Mm -hmm. Should you pass the class and take the test and pass it too? Yeah, that's absolutely. Right. That's right. You come back off the trail alive, you get the college credit. So you get it. Yeah, that's it. That's <laughs> the, that is the, that's the, the, the line. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Nice. Okay. Hey, moving on because I want to spend some time on your 2000 AT through hike, because as you mentioned before, we have so many resources available to us now. We've got YouTube. We've got, if you want to get a flavor for it, you can look at Instagram and see everything that's going on out there. You've got the internet. There's so many resources out there for hikers, through hikers in 2023. But in 2000, how did you plan? First of all, take us through how you decided to hike the AT. And then what did you do to prepare? How did you research? What did you think you were going to encounter? I decided to hike the AT um, because I had never been to any of the 14 states it went through. I had never been to the East Coast, really. I guess I had been through Florida, but I had never really been to the East Coast. So I decided to hike the AT based on the fact that I wanted to explore 14 states I had never been to. I decided to hike it when I did hike it because my wife at the time was working full-time during the day and in law school full-time at night. So I didn't see her a whole lot for four years and it just made sense to take a little bit of time during those four years. So did she, did I got to leave her absence. Did she know that you were gone? She did notice. She did notice. Yes, <laughs> she did. She did. She did. That was the reasoning in terms of why I chose that trip and the timing of it. In terms of preparation, yeah, there was as close to virtually nothing as you can imagine. There was an AT data book, like there still is, for a lot of long trails, which I, I bought right away. There was an AT guide at the time, 
And then there was a brand new map set actually, where, where, yeah, where I had to, I think I, it wasn't one map per state. There were probably 30, 35 maps and I put like, them like, in resupply like, boxes. It was like carrying a Thomas guide. It was care, like carrying a Thomas guide. Yeah. It was, our, it was our younger, crazy. Our younger listeners are going, what's a Thomas guide? Yeah. Google it. Take a look. That's Google what we did. That's what we dealt sure. with back in the day. <laughs> yes. So the 35 maps worked well. I sent them and got rid of them as I went. My wife sent me resupply boxes. I made all my own, I put all my own food together and she sent me 20 something resupply boxes at hostels and, and post offices. But in terms of finding out information about all those things, it was phone calls. I had to call all those hostels and I had to talk to all those people. There were no websites. There were no Facebook groups. There were no notes on far out apps. There were none of those things. So it was getting on the phone and calling hostels and finding out what they offered and if they would accept boxes and all those things. And then the other thing I fell into, which hang was- on, Hang on, Dreamer. I have to yeah. make phone calls because we live in a society now where people do not like to make phone calls. I'm guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. If there's a way to order food online somehow without talking to anybody, I, that's what I'm doing. Yep. I, I'm not calling up. I'm not staying on hold. I'm not talking to somebody who maybe hears me, maybe doesn't hear me. I have to repeat myself. I have to spell it, whatever else. I'm looking for an <laughs> online menu and I'm ordering. And so just the thought, I, I, I know I can just envision some of our younger listeners thinking, Okay, I've got to call people and I've got to talk to them about planning for my through hike. That sounds insane. Yeah, it was the only way to do it. And it was insane. It was a lot of hours and a lot of phone calls for sure, because there were busy signals. Uh, there were all kinds of things. <laughs> it was a busy, <laughs> What's a busy signal, right? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a challenge. The internet was brand new. There was email, but there, there wasn't much on the internet at that time. But what, what I found somehow, don't ask me how, through an AOL search probably, what I found was that a guy had hiked the AT in 99. He lived in Maine and he had blogged his trip. He didn't call it a blog at that point. He called it a journal and he had written about every day. So I read his entire journal and it really helped me get an idea of things that there was no way I was going to get an idea about because everything that exists now didn't exist then. So there were no, he had pictures in his journal too. So there was, there were no places to see pictures or video or read people's accounts really. So I did that. And there were some books out on the AT. So I bought all the books. I've still got a, a collection of books on a bookshelf that are all AT based, not, but it was. They're not on your Kindle? <laughs> no, microfilm. <laughs> <laughs> So it was challenging. It was challenging and no cell phones, obviously. So one of the one of the ways I had convinced my school district to give me a leave of absence was that I had built curriculum so that I could work with my fifth graders while I was on the trail. And I carried this little device. I wish I had it in my hands right now. I carried this little device. This will be great for listeners, Doc. It was a it was about it was a it was close to the size of a cell phone, but a little bigger. And the top of it flipped open. And it had a keyboard on it so you could type into it. Then the trick about this little piece of equipment, it was called a tell mail, is that it had this little piece that flipped out from the back. And what it did was it acted like an old fashioned fax machine. So when I got to a payphone, I would dial a 1-800 number and it would take a long time for this thing to send and receive. So I'd put a rubber band around the receiver and around this little piece of equipment and I'd hit send and it would spend 15, 20 minutes sending and receiving with its fax screams that most listeners maybe have never heard, but it's, you know, a sound you can never forget. And then I'd come out of the store with my pint of ice cream and sit there and finish it. And all my messages that I would send out would send and, and I would get messages too. And that's how I kept an online journal for my friends, my family, my students. And it's also how my students would send me messages and ask me things about the trail. And I could talk to them about my hike and work it into the curriculum and what they were learning back with their substitute teacher. So it was, it was a different world. It was like the stone age version of texting. Right? <laughs> yes. I, I, yes. I just imagine the line at the phone booth waiting for you to finish with your messages. 
<laughs> there, there were times that people came up to the phone booth and saw the receiver dangling with this thing attached to it with all this noise coming out of it and thought, what the hell is going on here? Not, yeah. Not touching that. No. And, <laughs> and I, I know we have listeners who are saying, what's a phone booth? Yeah. Yeah. Phone booth. Exactly. Yeah. A lot of old things in that story. Different world, no far out apps telling you where to go and giving you information about the next water or the best hostel. It was all a lot of research, but it's my trip this year on the Colorado Trail. It, it oh, felt thank, thank at you. times like I was cheating with the far out okay. app in, in terms of the AT because I've never used an app before out on a trail. I, I still have a backup paper map of, of every trip I'm on. I, I didn't have backup paper maps on, on the Colorado Trail, but I still carry backup paper maps and all that good stuff. Yeah, different world. All right, let's go through some statistics here. Do you go northbound or southbound? North. North. Okay. Started Springer, ended up in Katahdin. How long did it take you? 147 days. Got, got that dialed in. <laughs> Everybody knows their days when they started right. and when they ended, of course. That's yeah. right. And when you tell stories about your AT trip, what are some of the more popular ones that you tell? A good one was 17 days of rain where I was just putting on wet clothes every single day and taking off wet clothes every single night, just slipping my feet into wet socks and wet boots and wet shorts and a wet shirt every single day because nothing ever dried out. Um, so that was a good one. That Did was French foot. I didn't. And it wasn't cold rain. There was no use in wearing rain gear. Rain gear didn't work back then at all. And you're moving during the day and you stayed warm. But yeah, 17 days of being soaking wet was, was, was tough. I was about a quarter of a mile away from a lightning strike that got a ground strike that hit four people on the AT up in Pennsylvania. All were okay. One was unconscious when I got there, but regained consciousness and they were all okay. And we're all okay in the end. That was, that was a crazy day, as you might imagine, in terms of the storm itself, the strike coming upon these people and then working through what was going on with them and figuring out what I needed to do at the time without any, any training in, in, in first aid or anything else at that time, other than being a teacher and being trained in first aid and basic first aid and, and CPR, those things, which I didn't really have to lean on at all in that instance. But those were a couple. I had some interesting hitches. So you walked, did you see the lightning strike or did you walk up on it after it happened? There were many lightning strikes around during this storm. So I didn't see the lightning strike that impacted these four people. But then I there was I was up on a ball and there was nothing to do except keep walking at that point. So I'm walking north and about a quarter mile in front of me, I find four people, one unconscious, two pretty dazed and one pretty with it who was able to tell me exactly what happened. And, and nobody else had come upon them yet. Um, I stayed with them for... About a half an hour, the gentleman who had lost consciousness regained it in six or seven minutes, and the, the storm had passed over us. We got under a tree and sat there and talked a lot just to make sure everybody was of sound mind, made sure that everybody could walk on their own. We were only about a mile and a half from a road crossing to the north of us, and they were going north as well. At some point, a half an hour in or so, once we all felt like the situation was under control, the storm had passed, everybody was okay for the most part, nobody had any burns or anything like that, that was when I left. And then later on found out that all four were fine, three of them went and got checked out, and they were all okay. But, but yeah, that was, that was a crazy event. The, I've, come, I've ended up in, in lightning storms a handful of times, but that's the one that, that definitely sticks out in terms of some injuries. Yeah. Scary stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. I think I, I, think I had cut you off as you were heading to another story on the AT. Oh, I had, I just had some, I had some interesting hitchhikes on the AT. Oh, um, yes. Yeah. Interesting hitches. One, one in particular where I got into a car with another hiker um, and I, he was, the other hiker sat in the front seat with the driver, older man, and I sat in the back seat with a dog and the dog, it was a bucket seat. So all connected for your listeners, right? No, nothing in between the seats. And the dog sat probably 10 inches from my face the entire trip, 
just growling and snarling and foaming. And I, and at one point I said to the dog, it's okay. And the man at that point turned around and said, it's not okay. That's exactly what he's supposed to be doing. <laughs> so I sat there in the car for the next 15, 20 minutes till we got wherever he dropped us off with this dog just growling and looking like it was going to take my head off the entire time. I could just feel its breath on me. So that was, I've hitchhiked hundreds of times on trails and that was for sure the sketchiest hitch I've ever had. Yeah. Okay. And what, what did the 2018 hike teach Dreamer about himself? What'd you learn? To be as present as possible on every hike I'm in. It's easy to get caught up in the miles. It's easy to get caught up in the next town food. It's easy to get caught up in the end of your hike, but just being as present as possible. And I find what's really helped me stay as present as possible is learning, for instance, learning the names of the vast majority of the wildflowers on the Colorado Trail that I just did and speaking those names out loud as I would pass those flowers. Um, would help keep me present and keep me in the moment in terms of what I'm looking at, what's around me, clouds as well. I'm, I'm a lover of clouds in terms of types of clouds and building of thunderstorms and things like that. Putting names and descriptions to things that I'm seeing and speaking those either out loud or just thinking them in my head and keeping me as present as possible. Because doing the miles I do and the length of days that I hike, sometimes it's easy to get caught up in, in thinking about those things instead of appreciating everything around me. So that's what I've learned and what I learned during the AT. And it's taken me through my whole long distance hiking career, really. Now, careful there, Dreamer. That almost sounds like a hiking hack. Almost. But almost. I'm saving those. Okay. All right. Good. Good. <laughs> now, you, you've done the AT in 2000. Any desire to do the, the other two long trails? Yeah, definitely. I just don't have a block of time like that as a teacher until, until I'm all done. The PCT is a hard trail to through hike and get all the way through nowadays, right? Between weather and fires and bridges that are out and all the crazy stuff on that trail. But yeah, I'd love to hike the entire PCT. I've done probably about 1,200 miles of the PCT at this point. And I'd love to, to do a through hike of that. I, I'd also love to do a through hike of the Continental Divide Trail. But I think the next big trail that I'll hike is Pacific Northwest Trail. I, it's a mid-size in terms of 1,200 miles, but I would really like to hike the PNT before it becomes overhiked and overdeveloped and all the things that all the other trails have eventually become, which are fine, but I'd love to see the version of the PNT where 50 people a year are still just doing it. That would be wonderful. So that's on my list in terms of trying to get a longer hike smushed into a smaller time frame, maybe a summer. I don't know. The math comes out with a lot of miles a day to try to do that over the summer. And there's always the Hey Duke if you're looking for a less traveled <laughs> path. I am not looking for the Hey Duke. <laughs> I got a lot of trails on my list. The Hey Duke is not on it. <laughs> <laughs> Your score just went up to 42. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> and let's touch base just briefly on your most recent trip. You've mentioned it a couple of times, the Colorado Trail. So you, you felt like you were cheating because you, yeah. you were using some high fangled gadgetry to find your way out there. But is it a well marked path? Did you ever question, hey, am I on the trail or am I not on the trail? There are sections that are not marked as well, for sure. There, I came across a section of brand new trail that opened literally the moment that I walked up to the trail, a guy was putting the sign up to change the trail, which was an interesting piece because um, everybody's carrying far out and it's not on the far out app yet. So he's changing the trail yet the hundreds of hikers that are behind me are going to get to this new spot and it's not on their maps. Now I carry, I always have, I've used Caltopo for since it came out basically. So I had all the maps of that area downloaded of the entire Colorado Trail. So I was able on that section to see where I was, but there are, it's literally not mapped anywhere, this new section. It's a seven mile section. So 
there was a part at the end of the seven mile section that kind of petered out and the trail was gone. And it took me about 45 minutes to figure out the drainage in terms of where the trail went down. That was the only time that, that I really had any time fall any trouble following the trail. But yeah, not only is it marked extremely well, but that far out app in front of people's faces telling them every step of the way what to expect and comments on every one of those things. It was a learning experience for me to for me to use that app for sure. And I I know everybody's using it at this point and it makes sense that everybody's using it. It's good technology. But yeah, it did feel a bit like cheating. It did. Now Dreamer, I'm gonna put you on the spot. You've spent a lot of time in the Sierras, as have I. Not as much as you, not nearly as much as you. Yeah. I've been in the Sierras. I, I've spent some time in Colorado, not on the Colorado Trail, but just in Colorado. And it's pretty spectacular. What is the more spectacular scenery? Colorado. And I have a new appreciation for the Rockies. I really do. When you can look at a 13,000 foot ridge and there's green all the way to the top with wildflowers and patches of snow and granite or red rock and you've got all those colors and variations going on it is stunning when you say spectacular though when you look at a 13,000 foot ridge in the sierras and it's that knife edge granite and there is no color at all i i, I tend to still be a be an eastern sierra guy uh for sure but i was not disappointed in the rockies and the diversity of the high alpine areas um, in the San Juans, especially, was was just was absolutely amazing. I was I was just in awe of the beauty constantly. Okay, it's a very nice assessment. Hey, any interest in the FKT movement? You do a lot of miles. You cover a lot of ground. You put in the hours, and you don't need you don't need six months off to take off some FKTs. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? My thoughts are that if I had been born 20 or 25 years later, I think I would have been deep into the FKT movement for sure, for sure. But, but at 55 years old, in terms of the things that would interest me to set FKTs on, those things are not possible in terms of my realm and, and my, even even at my best fitness. The, the things that I would be interested in are, are things that String Bean and Jeff Garmeyer and all the big guys are doing at this point and big girls. And those are the kinds of things. Jeff Garmeyer did the, the Colorado Trail in nine days. And just as I finished, a woman completed a, a supported record of eight days on the Colorado Trail. Those are amazing. And in terms of my hike, I did my hike in, in 19 days. It averaged out to 26 miles a day. There were three days that I did very few miles, either into a town or into the end. I probably could have done that hike with those three days. I would have done that hike in 14 days, probably. I probably could have done that hike in, in 12 days, I think, when I think about it, maybe even 11, but anything close to Crazy Garmire, not a chance, not a chance. I'm glad you brought up his name. Uh, more impressive, Garmire's Colorado Trail in nine days or... Garmeyer's JMT in three days? I don't know. The JMT one beating String Bean by what minutes that days later was pretty darn impressive. And I really think that I, Garmeyer nine days was amazing, but granted, he really bonked at the very end of that and probably could have done it in almost half a day to a day less than he did it. He's, he's amazing. He's an impressive guy for sure. He's, sure. he's a funny guy too. He is hilarious to talk to. Quite a yeah, I, yeah. I've heard him on your podcast, and he's a good friend of a bunch of friends of mine. Yeah, I. His character. Yeah, and Dreamer, when I asked you that question, I didn't actually expect you to go for the FKT movement <laughs> because you know what you said earlier about being present. It's I think that's yeah. a, a natural friction between FKT and being present because you are pounding the miles. I would have to think uh, that a lot of stuff would be a blur. In an FKT attempt. True. And that's, and I work hard for things to be as little of a blur as possible, even on a, a high 30 mile day. Although even on a high 30 mile day, there might be a little bit of hallucination. All right. Hey, Dreamer, you know where we are right now? Where are we? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you for indulging me. <laughs> Hiking hacks. That's right, half calf. Hey, who who's half calf? 
I believe it's your daughter, right? Look at that. <laughs> You're dialed in. Yes. That's right. Half, half. It's time for hiking hacks. Uh, that part of the, the show where Dreamer will get to share some trail wisdom with our listeners to make their next outdoor experience even better. You've been dropping trail wisdom throughout the episode. I, I can't wait to hear what you have saved up for us. I got a couple. One is, is simply swim in every single lake. You're, you're not going to regret swimming, but you're going to regret skipping a lake and not swimming. And that, <laughs> my friends call me a bit crazy, but the more ice a lake has on it, the better swim it is. So I, I tend to jump in any body of water, multiple a day if I can. I, I love getting in the water and I love getting clean, even if it's only for the next two hours. So swimming in, in every lake is one. You're the down, other one- you're down, little, you're down to 34 now. Okay, okay, okay. The other one, a little more practical, which I've, I, I learned the hard way on the AT and have never looked back since then. Either don't ask the people that are coming in the opposite direction about the trail that you're about to encounter or take everything they say with a grain of salt because everybody has a different paradigm. Everybody has a different lens with a different set of experiences, with a different mindset and everything else. When somebody tells you that the next section is is, is, is gonna be a steep uphill because it was a steep downhill for them, that you gotta take that with a grain of salt. And I tend to not ask anybody about trail conditions ahead of me anymore with the exception of sometimes asking about water at a specific water source if they happen to stop, but I don't ask anybody about the trail conditions. And they might lie to you. For my, my 2017 trip on the JMT with my son, and we just were coming up the golden staircase and it was false top. I, I'd been up that route anyway. I, I knew there was false top after false top, but I was like exhausted. I was like at the end of my rope, I asked this guy how much longer he's probably another 45 minutes. And I was so pissed. I was so upset and angry. And literally, we got around the next bend in the trail, 40 feet away. And there it was. There, there were the Palisade Lakes. <laughs> he had just said that just to be mean. That's cruel. <laughs> That's very cruel. Yes. All right. Those are both excellent pieces of advice. There you have it. We are just about done here. Hope our listeners enjoyed our time with Adam. I want to thank him for joining us this week. Dreamer, tell us how we can keep up with you on social media and find out about your latest adventures. My business is at Alpine Adventure Coaching, every platform, including TikTok Doc, I'm there too. And oh. then my, per my personal stuff sets AT2000 on all the platforms. And then for the Alpine Adventure Coaching, my daughter is, is running my social media account at this point. So that's why I've got the, the old TikTok account as well. Nice. You are cutting yes. edge. Yeah. Yes. Is it a DIY TikTok? It is not. It is not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, remember to check out Hiker Trash Radio on social media as well. We are on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. And if you have comments or clips you want to share, you can send it to me at hikertrashradio at gmail.com. Also be impact. Now, unfortunately, we can't always be on the trail. And when we're not, we need to find a way to get our adventure fixed. So Dreamer, I'm going to ask you to share some outdoor adventure media with our listeners to help them get by. This could be a book, a movie, documentary. We call this segment Off the Beaten Path. What do you have? A uh, few different ones. One I've heard mentioned a few times, Ken Robinson's High Sierra Love Story. Probably one of the best compositions I've ever read on the Sierras themselves. He's a, he's an educator here in, in at Davis, UC Davis, and it's an amazing book. Also any of the late 1800s and early 1900s Sierra Club bulletins. I love reading those. They're fascinating in terms of the Whitney expeditions and all of the, the, the decisions and the goings on of those parties. And then- Do you know much about the high trips? About the what? The, the high, high trips? trips? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I learned a lot about the high trips a number of years ago when I was um, attempting the Sierra high route, because a lot of those areas had those Sierra club high routes or high trips. Yeah. And then of course, anything by my, my good friend, Jason Fitzpatrick, mile and a half, Wood Tech, the Noah Tech behind the scenes. And then of course, Free Outside, which is his new movie about Garmeyer's record on the Colorado trails. Yeah. Anything by Jason. Now, do you know Jason? I do. Jason and I are good friends. Nice. Yeah. I were, just, you, were you in mile and a half? I, I wasn't in mile and a half, but two weeks ago when I was up in the miter, I was with most of the cast from mile and a half. Yeah. 
yeah, most most of those guys were there. And I've been friends with Jason for years and do lots of backpacking trips with him, at least one a year, him and a group of friends that that we we go different places, Teton Crest Trail, the Mitre, the Ruby Mountains, Ruby Crest Trail. They did the Wonderland Trail. So just a fun group of people, but but yeah, known Jason for a long time. Yeah, Jason's been on at least once, maybe twice. I have a feeling he's been on twice and he is he is a great conversation. He is a great conversation. He is indeed. Yeah, his buddy's been on your podcast too, Jeff Hester. And Jeff Hester is yep. one of the one of the guys in that group from SoCal Hiking. Yep. So yeah, all good guys. Six pack of peaks. Yep, six yep. pack of peaks. Yep. Okay. What have we not asked you? All right. Before we wrap things up tonight, Dreamer, just one more segment called What Have I Not Asked You That You're Dying to Tell Us About? What do we miss? I know looking at our outline, we, we skipped a lot of information, but if you had to pick out one choice detail to, to share with our listeners tonight, what would you like to share? I think the fact that the reason that I go out and I stay out and the reason that I'm so committed to working with people looking to long distance hike is because I'm always seeking uh, a sense of awe. And I think that living in the front country, we can go days, weeks, months without really feeling that sense of awe. And when I'm in the back country, I, I don't know how many times a day I feel that sense of awe, right? You look up at a night sky and that, that amazing view, you look down from, uh, from a view of a peak onto a lake or a meadow you watch a marmot playing in the wildflowers. It happens all day, every single day in the backcountry. And I think it, it keeps me coming back time and time again. And I'd love to share the ability to connect with that feeling of awe with as many people as I can. Okay. Your students, your past students, your current students, and your future students are very lucky to have you on their team. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. Appreciate wow. that. All right. Hey, we are finished. I want to thank you for coming on the podcast. I wish you the very best in your future endeavors and adventures. And maybe when we're both retired, maybe we can take on something big together. I'd love it. Sounds great. You name the hike and I'll show up. Now you hike sunrise to sunset in order for me to keep up that pace. Cause you're like gone. You're a ghost out there. I might have to do 18 hour days just to have a shot to see you in the distance. I, I, I could adapt my pace to, to just about anybody in just about any situation, Doc. So I think we'll be able to find a compromise. Okay. Sounds good. Hey, as we close up today, any shout outs to friends and family? All my hiking buddies, for sure. And then my family, my wife, Paula, and my daughter, Bella, who are amazing supporters of my journey. And my daughter, who's taken over that social media piece, is, is amazing as well. It's good to have daughters take over your social media, isn't it? It is. It is. We can share that too. Yep. All right. Hey, thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Always remember the trail is the trail. It doesn't care if you want to go downhill. It doesn't care if, you're, if it's almost dark and you're looking for a campsite. It doesn't even care if you can't wait to get to the phone booth to upload your text for a good 45 minutes. The trail is the trail. Embrace the suck. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.